Hello, and welcome to today's GNCC Espresso Live. My name is Hugo, and I'll be your host, moderator, MC, and so forth for the next hour. We're very pleased to host today's webinar on a very important topic, financial resiliency. If anyone needed a reminder of the importance of resiliency, the last two years have provided many. The organizations that have survived are those which were resilient and could weather the storm. Even today, as we hopefully move out of the pandemic, prices and interest rates are rising, labor shortages, supply chain issues, and war are disrupting economic recovery, and economists talk about recession and stagflation to come. There will be more shocks and setbacks in the future. The good news is that we have experts with us to help you overcome these obstacles as well. And I'm pleased to be joined today by two such experts, Scott Schramm and TC Murray from Meridian Credit Union. Meridian is Ontario's largest and Canada's second largest credit union, helping to grow the lives of more than 370,000 members. They operate 89 branches and 15 business banking centers, managing over $26 billion in assets. Their 1,900 employees are experts offering a full range of financial products and services. In addition, they are committed to investing in the communities they serve. For example, in 2019, 50% of their employees supported over 425 community organizations and not-for-profits. Meridian is the Ontario Chamber's Banking Affinity Partner, and for the month of May, they are doubling their welcome bonus for new members. And all new accounts will enjoy free services for one year and a 30% reduction in fees after that. Existing members can still take advantage of the 30% fee reduction in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. If you're interested in this, we'll put the link in the chat for you to learn more. And now to our guest speakers today. TC Murray was born and raised in St. Catharines, where he still resides today. TC has worked for Meridian Credit Union for over 10 years, working in both corporate and frontline delivery roles. In TC's current role of Meridian, he works as a director on Niagara's business banking team where he oversees a portfolio consisting of commercial real estate, operating companies, and land development and construction. TC is a graduate of Brock University, where he obtained his Honours Bachelor of Business Administration with a concentration in human resources and organizational behavior. In his spare time, he enjoys playing baseball, traveling, and spending time with his wife and three kids. Scott Schramm was born and raised in St. Catharines and now lives in Welland. Scott has worked for Meridian Credit Union for four years and in banking for the last seven. Scott has worked as a teller, a financial services representative, and currently as a financial services advisor, where he assists members with many facets of their day-to-day -day banking with a strong focus on investing and mutual funds. Scott graduated with an Honours Bachelor of Business Economics degree from Brock University in 2019, and has also completed his Responsible Investment Specialist designation. Outside of work, Scott likes to play hockey as well as travel and go camping with his fiance. Our format today will be a presentation from our guests followed by an interactive Q&A session. We have many questions submitted for Scott and TC, but if you have something you would like to ask, please type it in the chat. We are committed to posing as many of your questions as we can. The chat can only be seen by the panelists and we will not reveal your name if you ask a question, realizing that finances are a sensitive topic. So please do not be shy. Lastly, you can enable live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you wish. Now, with the introductions out of the way, we can get on to the good stuff. And I'd like to turn things over first to Scott. Thank you, Hugo, Hugo, and, Hugo and thank you for uh, having me today. Um, so uh, I'll be uh, going over a little bit of uh, financial resilience and wellness from the, um, from the personal side of things. Um, so hopefully everybody can uh, see my screen there. Uh, and uh, yeah, then we can jump right into it. But as Hugo said, I uh, am a financial services advisor with Meridian uh, for the last four years. And um, again, with a strong focus on investments and really just making sure that our members are um, in a good position um, and, and have that financial wellness improved each and every day. So the first piece here, it'll let me change slides, there we go. Uh, what does financial resilience and wellness mean? Um, so financial wellness, sometimes called financial health or well-being, is the ability to meet your financial needs, 
feeling of security about your financial future and the freedom to make choices that allow you to enjoy life. And that truly is what financial wellness is, is being able to enjoy your life and, and your passions. It's not necessarily about the numbers in your bank account, how good your investments are performing. Um, you know, everybody wants to be a, a millionaire, but um, that's really not what it's about. It's about being able to day in and day out, know that you're confident in your plan and to live free from the thought of repercussions of what may happen when the unexpected does happen. I always like to say uh, we never really know what may happen, but we know that something will happen. And so if we can get ahead of that and plan accordingly, when the unexpected does arise, we're going to be prepared and we're going to be able to face that head on without impacting our future uh, goals and our current, um, you know, passions again, that, that we, that make life, you know, truly valuable. So there's four keys to financial wellness, uh, which are spending, saving, borrowing, and planning. So we'll touch on spending and saving here. Um, so when you're spending, understanding how much you're spending and on what by creating a budget is very important. And I think one of the most important pieces of that is actually knowing what you're spending your money on. Um, it can be a very eye-opening process. I know personally for myself it has been. Uh, when you actually do write out your budget and you see how much you're spending on one area compared to another. And then at that point, you can start to say, okay, I can lower this category, or I didn't expect this category to be that high. Um, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, maybe it's just a little bit here and there, but uh, do every little bit can, can help out um, by uh, uh, just reviewing that budget monthly. Uh, and then as obvious as it seems, paying your bills on time to avoid late fees, additional interest, and potentially any negative impacts on your credit score are really going to be very important as well. Uh, for savings, um, again, seems pretty straightforward, but um, one of the most important things is setting realistic goals. Um, for me, realistic goals have to include a timeline. If they don't have a timeline, it's going to be very easy. I mean, for uh, especially for business owners, you get, you're very busy all the time, and it's very easy without that timeline to push it to the side and say, I'll get to it when I'm not busy. What we see is that that timeline never, or you're, you're always busy, right? So if we can set a timeline for these goals, then ultimately you're going to be able to track your progress towards that. So setting that goal and that timeline is, is extremely important. Make savings a habit. Um, you want to make sure that you're paying yourself first. So from the personal side of things, when you're getting your paycheck or your income, um, the first thing you do, you put 10 to 15% and you operate on uh, to savings and then you operate on the rest. So um, you take your paycheck, it's $1,000, you can operate with $850, the other 150 is going towards your long-term savings plan. Um, setting aside your emergency savings and then saving for long-term savings is, is uh, ultimate for really making sure that you do have your financial freedom when you do get um, to a point where maybe your income is going to be reduced in, in retirement. So uh, the next one, so again, borrowing and planning. Uh, borrowing, uh, we wanna make sure that we have manageable debt, uh, meaning that you do have uh, more good debt than bad debt and you have uh, a, a strong plan for paying it off. And then ultimately that'll help you with um, paying off your, or, or improving your credit score and making sure you maintain a good credit score. Um, so most people don't like debt. Uh, most people want to, you know, pay off all their debt as soon as possible. Um, and, and I mean, when it comes to bad debt, absolutely. We want to make sure that that is, is taken care of. Um, when it comes to good debt, we want to make sure that we utilize good debt. So, you know, your, your mortgage is typically going to be a good debt. Um, if you can use the debt to essentially improve your, your life and your financial well-being, um, especially if interest rates are low, um, then 
you know, it, it is a little bit more of an in-depth uh, conversation to go through when utilizing debt that way. But uh, ultimately, uh, don't don't be too afraid of debt, but at the same time, make sure that your uh, income is is manageable. Talk to your advisor, uh, make a plan to make sure that it is manageable, and and try not to sh uh, stray away too far from that plan. And then planning, uh, making sure you have insurance for your own peace of mind and protection. Uh, understand your taxes and and plan for them, and then create a plan to help you save for retirement or or whatever your your goal may be. It might be you know education savings for your children, could be traveling savings, it, it could be uh, any number of things. But making sure that um, that we are touching on that. Um, there's there's so many details that that go into a plan, such as insurance, taxes continuity, um, investments, and then the debt, mortgages, things like that, right? Um, it is so important to talk to your advisors, talk to um, whomever your financial professionals are, and uh, formulate that plan with them to, uh, to really improve uh, your, your well-being there. Um, so how can you build your financial resilience? Um, so there's five uh, kind of areas. There's there's enough. There's definitely going to be more than five ways to build your financial wellness and your financial resilience. But these are just uh, five that kind of come to mind. Um, so the first one here, financial uh, self awareness. Take an inventory of of where you're at. You know, figure out your income, figure out your expenses. Um, and again, writing that out on paper or or putting it in a spreadsheet, whatever that might look like for you is ultimately going to benefit you in the long run. Um, a lot of the times it does take a little bit of work to put that together, but it will help when you kind of get that, that clear whole picture um, to see what you can do to improve. Uh, financial knowledge and informed decisions. Take advantage of your advisors. Make sure that they're working for you, they're giving you information. And when you are meeting with them, use it as a learning opportunity. Um, they're gonna be the experts in their field. You're the expert in your field. You know how to do your job the best and better than anybody. They're the same. They know how to do uh, financing and they can help you out with that. So really take advantage of that, learn from them. And if you have any ideas that you come across maybe on the internet or from a friend, run by them as well and see what their opinion on it is. Um, building a plan, again, very intuitive. Um, talk to your advisor and again, figure out what your goals are, set the timelines, whether it's retirement, education planning, traveling, um, purchasing your dream home, a cottage, whatever it might be. Talk to your advisor, set that timeline, put the plan on paper and track your progress as much as you can. Um, emotional strength. So this one here is, is interesting because um, you it's you need emotional strength to build financial wellness, but you also gain financial uh, wellness or, or emotional strength from your financial wellness. So um, to anybody who's been, you know, the struggling student in, in college or university uh, and you're, you're eating ramen noodles, um, it, uh, it, it, can be, it can be tough, right? Or, you know, single parents as well, right? It's, it's tough and you, you do have a lot of emotional strength um, already putting that, um, that plan in place and being able to plan for the unexpected is just going to improve your emotional strength as well when it comes to money. And then the last thing here is being proactive, knowing. So again, I mentioned the internet, um, getting kind of tips and ideas from friends, things like that. Be pro proactive and talk to your advisors. You know, sometimes advisors, you might, they might reach out to you every six months to a year. Talk to them more if you have an idea or if you think of something that, that might work out better for you and keep them updated because life changes quickly. You know, you could go from being a single uh, person to having a family within a year, right? Um, and then, and everything changes, right? When the pandemic first hit, that's another huge um, aspect that nobody really could have planned for. And I'm sure as a business owner, your life would have changed. Um, talk to your advisor, stay updated with them, talk to them often, and um, be proactive if you, if you ever come across things that you think might work for you. The last uh, piece here that I would like to touch on as well 
is a little bit of a spotlight for Meridian. Um, Meridian has uh, created a, uh, a survey that calculates your financial resilience score. So I just did an example here for someone who uh, may have been in their, uh, you know, working years where, you know, pre-retirement 39 to 65 in that age group. And I just went through some examples uh, of the survey and, and answered some questions uh, in the background. And it gave me this financial resilience score of a 50. So not everyone is gonna be exactly rounded like that. You know, you might get anywhere from a, from a zero to a hundred. Um, but we can see there that anything above 80, you're really healthy from a 40 to 79, you're on the right track, but could use some roof, room for improvement. And a zero to 39 will tell you we need we need to look at things uh, soon. Um, and the other nice thing about this is that we, we will compare you to other Ontarians with a similar age and a similar income. Um, and then you can see, you know, am I above average, you know, maybe average or below average? And what can I do to sort of sort of bump that number up? So our goal at Meridian is to improve the lives of our of our members and ultimately that'll help increase their financial resilience score. The other nice thing about this here, and this is my uh, last slide, so um, it will go over the, um, the spend score, the save score, the borrow score, and the plan score. So again, I just used some, uh, some general uh, sort of answers when I was doing the survey, but we can see here that with the answers that I gave, I would have been below average for, for most Ontarians. Um, and obviously the plan score is where there would have been the most room for improvement. My borough score isn't too far off from, from the pr provincial average and my uh, spend score and save score could also use some improvement as well. Um, so ultimately this will help give us an idea and has great links to articles on different ways that you can manage your money, um, reviewing the basics of savings and um, some other uh, good items in there as well. So. Uh, if you're ever curious to see how you're doing, go into it with uh, an honest, uh, an honest read through the survey, and uh, that's on Meridian's website. And um, yeah, maybe it'll help uh, be a little eye-opening, and you can kind of see where where you're at as well. And so, with that being said, I will turn this over to. T.C. Murray, who is our Director of Business Banking at Meridian. And, uh, the floor is yours, T.C. Thank you, Scott. And uh, everybody see the screen? Um, so yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, thank you, Hugo, for uh, having me on the show today. Um, so today I'm kind of just going to take you through uh, the current landscape for business owners and how Meridian can help you. So first, uh, as many of you are likely familiar with Meridian Credit Union as a whole, but in particular, like the Spotlight or Business Banking offering. Um, so as Hugo mentioned, Meridian has uh, 15 commercial business banking centers across the province, uh, from London to Barrie, uh, Niagara up to Ottawa. Um, in particular, Niagara's business banking team consists of 36 employees, which is led by regional vice president, Steve Ott. Uh, our team consists of both commercial and small business advisors, as well as a group of strong support staff, all of which have the expertise to help business owners here in Niagara with all their banking needs from checking accounts to lending products across a wide array of industries. Uh, Meridian also offers financing through a subsidiary Meridian OneCap. Uh, this can always be a good alternative for personal equipment outright for your business. Uh, me personally, I've been with Meridian for uh, just over 10 years and uh, held various positions within the company on both the corporate and front line, front line delivery side of the business. Uh, the last eight years have been uh, working on a commercial team here in Niagara. Uh, I worked my way up from an analyst into a more senior role within the business banking center as director. Uh, kind of as mentioned previously, my portfolio spans a wide, away, wide array of industries and has everything from not-for-profits to operating companies to commercial mortgages to uh, land development and construction. So the role of relationship manager is really just to be a trusted advisor and part of a strategic network of professionals. It's important to have a good network of professionals because as a business owner, it's impossible to wear all hats at all times. So if you surround yourself with a group of trusted advisors, it allows you as a business owner to focus on running your day-to-day -day operations, ensure you're delivering on your promise to your customers. With that being said, let's take a, couple take a look at a couple topics that are likely on most business owners' minds. 
So let's start with inflation. Uh, inflation is essentially a decrease in the purchasing power of money, which is reflected in the general increase in price of goods and services in an economy. We are currently experiencing record levels of inflation here in Canada. Uh, they're the highest since January 1991. Um, as the last reports in March, inflation was about 6.7% against a target inflation rate of 2%. Um, inflation has largely been driven by a global supply chain crisis that was a byproduct of COVID-19. Uh, this has caused pent up demand for products and a scarcity of raw materials to build these products. Uh, this has led to uh, supply and demand issues in the economy, which in turn leads to higher prices for the end consumer. Although low interest rates have kept, helped keep the economy chugging along, uh, it has added to the inflation issues. It has encouraged, encouraged consumer spending and also allowed people to make larger purchases they might otherwise have not made, given the low level interest they are paying to buy the item on credit. Uh, when interest rates are high, it generally has the opposite effect and encourages people to uh, save and spend less. As a result of less spending, companies will often increase prices at a slower rate or even lower them to increase demand for their products. Uh, a good example of this right now is kind of the used car market. So I'm sure each of you have probably driven by a dealership and noticed very little supply. Uh, this is due to a shortage of microchips, which in turn has lowered supply of new vehicles in the market. As a result of lack of new inventory, this has caused an increased demand for used vehicles, which seem to cost as much as buying a new vehicle these days. Uh, I know I was recently on vacation and there were some uh, ads on the radio that talked about they'd buy your used vehicle for what you paid originally whenever you bought it. Um, so as you can see, the impacts of inflation are everywhere, um, but I'm sure most of you've seen it really in three key areas. Uh, that would be transportation, food, and shelter. All three of these areas are generally the biggest expense item in any household budget. I know personally, every time I go to the grocery store to pick up stuff for lunches and dinners, I feel like it cost me $100 and I walk out with two bags of food and I'm kind of like, what did I buy? Um, so as a business owner, what can you do? Uh, my best advice is kind of to do a health check on your business and look at these key areas. First, create a budget and look at the expense management. Is there any expenses that can be cut and not providing a significant return on investment? Is there a way to automate a process without sacrificing customer experience? Run what if scenarios on key input costs or even staffing. Is hiring that new employee a need to have or a want to have? You can always look at implementing pricing changes. Now this isn't always uh, favorable for your customers and, and could create a bit of negative blowback, but are you able to pass these increased costs onto your customers? If so, make sure you're transparent with your customers and help them understand the challenges that you as a business owner are facing when possible. Also, if possible, make sure people are aware in advance of future price increases. This allows your customers to plan and helps them digest what is coming their way. Another good option is review your suppliers. Can you pre-order in advance? Is there cost savings to buying in bulk? Is there any flexibility on repayment terms or financing options? Are they seeing issues from their suppliers and obtaining key inputs for your business? Although you may have a long-standing relationship with the supplier, it doesn't hurt to explore your options and, and sort of have a plan B. This can help disrupt, disrupt disruptions for your business and stop you from having to turn away a sale because you do not have the item in stock. Lastly, talk to other business owners in your industry and see what they are doing. You are not alone in this and others are facing the same challenge as you are. Now that we've looked at inflation, this leads us to our next topic, which is rising interest rates. So it's no secret that interest rates are on the rise. Bank of Canada has recently increased the overnight rate by half a point to 1% from a low of a quarter point at the beginning of the pandemic in March, 2020. Now when the pandemic hit, uh, we saw Bank of Canada introduce three consecutive 50 basis point decreases over the period of a month to help keep the economy afloat. Now on a forward looking basis, uh, Bank of Canada is expected to meet five more times before the end of the year and further rate increases are expected, but to what extent we still not quite aren't sure. Um, so how does the increase in overnight rate what does that mean for your business? So generally as Bank of Canada raises their overnight rate, it becomes more expensive for banks to borrow money and in turn, they raise their prime rates to cover the additional costs. Given prime rates serve as a starting point for variable rate loans, as prime increases, so does your cost of borrowing. Fixed rates have also been on the rise recently. Uh, the most pro common product with fixed rate uh, would be a mortgage on your primary residence. So it was not too long ago that many people were uh, seeing uh, mortgages offered for under 2%. I know as of today, uh, we're seeing five-year fixed mortgage rates around the 4.2% mark from the major banks. And this will have an impact on carrying costs when it comes time for these homeowners to renew. The same can be said for commercial mortgages, with many people refinancing and purchasing properties in the last couple of years at interest rates near record low levels. 
the more money being spent on carrying that more debt is less money being spent on discretionary spending. So why are they raising interest rates? So the simple answer there is kind of inflation. By right? the government increasing interest rates, it'll slow consumer and business spending, especially on major purchases such as new homes, cars, or capital expenditures for businesses, which will hopefully bring down inflation. Uh, the biggest and most immediate impact most businesses will feel are on variable rate loans, and which the most common would be your operating line of credit, which provides working capital for companies to cover their short-term financial obligations. Uh, as the cost of debt increases, so does your ability to borrow, which has a direct impact on the cash flow of your company. Uh, fixed rate products will see a lagging impact depending on where you are in the term of your loan. So uh, if you manage to lock in recently to a longer term fixed rate, you'll enjoy the benefits of the low interest rate environment until you come to term maturity. Um, it is at this time that most of these businesses will start to feel that. Um, so as a business owner, what can you do? Sorry. Uh, the, simple, the simple answer is review your cost of capital. What are your capital needs? Where is it coming from? And how much are you willing to pay for it? Um, your cheapest form of capital will always be personal or related party investments, grants, uh, or terms of your suppliers. Another thing to keep in mind is that secured lending will always be cheaper than unsecured lending. So it may be wise to consider if you have an asset, are you willing to pledge that asset security? This could help lower your interest costs and free up cash flow. So now that we've kind of talked about inflation, interest rates, let's discuss the impact it will kind of have on, on the real estate market. So uh, let's start with residential. So on the residential side, we're starting to see slower absorption rates on new development projects, which are being brought to market. Uh, developments that would typically sell out within the first few weeks are now seeing slower sales. And this is due to several reasons. First, investors generally make up a big portion of these sales, uh, especially in the condo market. Uh, so many investors generally have one of two strategies. Strategy one, they look to get in early on pre-sales and eventually assign their purchase to another customer prior to, prior to having to close on the property. With sales starting to slow and concerns about price points, this strategy is starting to become riskier for investors as double digit gains are kind of used to seeing. Uh, they just aren't there. So when they go to assign the unit, are they able to assign that unit for a higher price and make that profit? Strategy two is to purchase properties or rental. With increased carrying costs and rents already kind of being at record levels in the area, this strategy requires more upfront capital from investors to close on the deal, as people can only afford to pay so much rent to cover the cost of carrying the property, which in turn impacts the borrower's ability to service the debt. Um, for the buyer who is looking to purchase a primary residence, they're also facing the same challenges as investors looking to use the property as a rental. As rates go up, it'll be harder to qualify for personal mortgages, and without housing prices coming down, the purchaser is forced to make up the difference with a larger down payment. Um, you know, if, if you're paying $1,600, $1,700 a month in rent, uh, it, it's hard to save up that down payment. So this is a challenge many people are facing. And this is kind of what's kept rents high and the, the rental market so high. Um, the resale market, we're also starting to see a slowdown as more supply is coming to market and people are appearing to be more cautious before entering into what is probably one of the biggest purchases of their lives. Uh, given the increased stress on people's budgets, it's harder to save for that down payment, as mentioned, and qualify for these larger, more, larger mortgages and interest rate increases. Uh, there are a lot of factors at play in the housing market right now, but it appears to be at least slowing down a bit and giving consumers the ability to breathe and think through their decisions instead of being caught up in the frenzy of bidding wars. Um, it's kind of crazy, but a lot of people are going in with no conditions and, and just kind of hoping for the best, which is, uh, it, it's not a very uh, uh, smart decision, but I, I understand the necessary, it was a necessary decision for most people. Um, on the commercial real estate side, uh, I expect to kind of see a bit of a standoff between buyers and sellers. Uh, sellers will be looking to obtain the high prices they've been seeing in the market recently, while buyers and investors will probably take a more cautious approach. Uh, with rates on the rise, we're also seeing borrowers requiring larger down payments so there's generally, as they're generally paying premiums to acquire these properties based on future cash flow, which the property is not yet realized. As such, they're not able to obtain the same leverage which they have previously in, in the past. Uh, this is particularly relevant in the multifamily residential market, where rent increases are capped by the province on an annual basis. So until that unit becomes vacant, the borrower is not able to increase the rents to market. Uh, currently, we're really seeing we're seeing very low turnover in this market um, due to the barriers of home ownership uh, and people not being able to afford increased rental costs of changing units. Uh, like for example, a simply unit moved to a different unit or a different apartment building could cost that renter hundreds of dollars in extra rent per month. So looking ahead, uh, it is tough to say where things are headed. Uh, I've had some recent discussions with some appraisers. 
and they know that they did not expect to see an increase in cap rates in the near short term. Uh, this is largely due to everyone catching their breath and from what could be seen as a crazy few years. As cap rates are the main driver of looking at the income approach for value of a property, it can have a profound impact on what the property is worth. Uh, generally speaking, when interest rates do rise, so do cap rates, which bring down the value of property. As the higher the cap rate is, the riskier the investment. Also, every purchaser has a different motivation for buying. Uh, an owner-occupied property may need a uh, property for specific reasons, such as growth, uh, whereas an investor will be looking for a specific rate of return on their purchase. As such, they'll be viewing the purchase of the property through two totally different lenses. So now that we've kind of talked about interest rates, uh, let's see the impact it'll have on working capital. So first, let's start here. Everyone has a need for working capital, and everyone is seeing their working capital needs increase as costs go up. So it's important to know that you as a business owner, you're not alone in this. So a common theme I've discussed is that interest rates rise, so does the cost of borrowing, which impacts your working capital as more of your cash is going to cover the interest cost of carrying that debt. Furthermore, the higher the cost to borrow, the less debt you'll be able to service. So most loan facilities are going to have a specific debt service covenant, which will be required to be met on an annual basis. Uh, so unless you're generating more profits, it'll become harder to meet these covenants and likely impact your ability to borrow on a go forward basis. So as a business owner, kind of what can you do? So first step is to strengthen your balance sheet. A company with a strong balance sheet will always be considered a strong candidate for financing. Uh, there's lots of ways to strengthen a balance sheet, but uh, definitely monitor the cash going in and out of the business. Uh, if you have more cash going out than coming in, it'll quickly wreak havoc on your balance sheet. This is especially important when it comes to management compensation. Uh, ask yourself, are you taking an appropriate salary or dividends compared to what you're generating in profits? This tends to happen quite a lot where companies kind of hit a downturn and the management compensation is not adjusted during those down years. Um, generally, that's because people need to fund a certain lifestyle that they've been accustomed to and, and they've had like a prolific growth or, or been doing well. So by managing that compensation, it'll help you build cash reserves and retain earnings in the company. Another way to manage your balance sheet is to ensure you have good accounts receivable management. Uh, you know, sure it's great to make a sale, but if you do not get paid for that sale, it'll end up as a loss on your bottom line. Not only will this improve your balance sheet, but it'll also improve your cash flow. So you can measure your accounts receivable days by dividing your uh, accounts receivable by revenue and multiplying it by number of days in a year. Ideally, you want this number to be as low as possible. A higher number could constrain your ability to deliver on more sales as you may have to pay for the inventory uh, or, or raw goods faster than you're being paid by your customers. So it'll really slow the growth rate of your company. Uh, the same can be said for inventory. Uh, it does not make sense to sit on debt inventory when it could be converted to cash and invested back in the current inventory which can be sold, profits realized and the process repeated. Also sitting on too much inventory will cause issues with cash flow. So a, a good way to manage inventory is to look at inventory turnover ratio. So this gets calculated by dividing cost of goods sold by average inventory over the same period. The more returns of inventory generally means higher sales and larger profits, which leads to more cash flow. This is especially important in industries where inventory is perishable or is uh, kind of bound by um, technology. So, um, you know, especially in power tools, the technology is ever changing. So if you have an old kind of uh, drill with a plug that you plug in, electric drill, like, you know, nobody wants to buy that because everyone's buying the newest and the meanest, you know, 24 volt, 36 volt drill. Um, the last thing you can do as a business owner uh, when looking to access for capital is just explore alternative sources. So there are so many ways to raise capital from shareholder loans, grants, bank debt, selling equity in your company. All forms of capital have their purpose and come with pros and cons. Do your research, find the right mix that you're comfortable with as a business owner. So, um, sort of in closing, uh, I'd like to thank you for having me on the show today and encourage all of you to use all the resources at your disposal. Your Chamber of Commerce, Small Business Enterprise Center is a great place to start, especially for startups where finding access to capital is the most difficult. Uh, financial institutions will always view a startup as the most risky, and, and I understand the, the plight of business owners that are just trying to get some money to get their uh, company off the ground. Also, reach out to your trusted advisors who, and have that genuine conversation with them on what you're looking to accomplish and what your tolerance for risk is. Uh, that being said, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Scott and myself, and we'd be happy to discuss financial needs and help you develop a game plan to meet those needs. Wow, thank you uh, so much to you both for that. That was uh, really interesting and insightful. And 
I don't say that lightly about PowerPoints about finance, but that was genuinely very insightful. And I, I certainly have a lot of questions now. I just want to say, TC, you'll you'll never part me from my corded drill. Okay. I don't think <laughs> you can beat the, the talk of that. So I'm not sold on the 24 goal thing, but uh, I, I do have a lot of questions and I hope you don't mind if we just, just dive right in with, with some of them. And uh, for our audience as well, if you do have questions after that, then please type them in the chat and I'll try and get to them. But uh, first of all, maybe I can ask in a, in a general sort of way, um, when you're looking at uh, household finance or business finance, what are the like three big red flags that tell you perhaps that, uh, that there's something wrong here? Like some major indicators that resiliency or efficiency uh, can be improved. And uh, Scott, maybe I can I can turn to you first to, to answer. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I'm happy to answer that one. So um, there's definitely, I mean, there's there's a ton of things that that it could be. The three that stick out for me are escalating debt. Um, so basically if, you know, just from a personal standpoint, a personal advice standpoint, if you notice that you're having these bad debts that I was kind of touching on your credit cards, unsecured lines of credit, things like that, they're beginning to, to creep up and you notice that you're not making your, your payment in full that month or, or you're starting to pay less than that, uh, that, that you'd normally are. I mean, ideally with credit cards, especially you're paying them in full every month. That's not always the reality, but if you start to see that, nip it in the bud, get it done. To really, if you can stop that first one from escalating, then you're in, then you're doing okay. Um, another one would be not having your emergency savings or a contingency plan if something goes wrong. Um, if you don't have that, as soon as that one thing goes wrong, um, you're you're dipping into your financial freedom bucket, right? You're dip you're dipping into um, your you know, your bucket that was going to be maybe meant for retirement or your kids' education savings or um, potentially, you know, you were looking at doing some improvements within the business or something like that, that could definitely uh, be impacted and then be detrimental in the long run. And then the last one is, for me, it would be having no budget. Like you, again, without having that, that on paper and not having that budget, there's really not a whole lot that you're, you're not, you're not going to be able to look at your financial situation and say, this needs to be improved. You're just going to keep going and going with what's comfortable. And eventually it's going to end up being too much. So I would say escalating debt, no emergency savings and, and no budget are definitely three red flags to me of there's, there's going to be room for improvement when it comes to financial wellness. Okay. Interesting. So if you have credit cards and, uh, going into your savings and that sort of thing. Okay, uh, TC, from the business side, uh, what, what are the red flags that you would look for? Uh, there's kind of like three key indicators to keep a close eye on because together they indicate business resilience and strength. So first is kind of manage, uh, management of operating expenses. So um, relative to sales. So this is kind of known as operating efficiency. So uh, if you divide your, uh, your operating expenses by the cost of total sales, this will kind of let you know exactly how much of every dollar you're earning is going out in expenses. So um, if you have an increasing ratio, this is a red flag that your business efficiency is kind of trending negatively. I know this has kind of been uh, something Meridian has been focusing on and uh, it, it's important because it, you want to know like for every dollar you make, how much is actually going out the door just to cut, keep the lights on. Um, as I mentioned, kind of inventory management. So uh, as I talked about, kind of divide the cost of goods sold by your average inventory for the same period. This will give you the, uh, the rate at which inventory is sold, used, replaced. Um, healthy businesses have a high turnover relative to industry and type of product. Uh, a lower turnover ratio indicates inefficient management of inventory, which can impact working capital and, and profitability. So uh, this number does really uh, vary based on your industry because everybody's kind of using uh inventory in a different way so if you're running a grocery store with perishable items like you have to turn that inventory over and over uh if you are uh you know selling tvs you might not have to to turn them as fast but you know technology moves so rapidly you do have to turn them a little quicker um, and lastly is kind of efficient use of assets so the asset turnover ratio measures the efficiency of a company's assets and generating revenue or sales so a tr ratio trending lower is indicative that uh, you're using your assets less efficiently um, to generate sales in case you may need to visit your business financial plan or, or kind of how your operations are running 
Okay, so if anyone's listening and thinking, hey, that's me, then they should probably reach out and talk to you, right? Okay, interesting. Um, the next question I think is, is for Scott, and it's, is it possible uh, for someone, for a household, for a person to be maybe too focused on resiliency? Like if you have too large a cash reserve, too much liquid assets, not enough investments, like what are, what are warning signs that you might be too far in the other direction, as it were? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you hit the, the nail right on the head there with having too large of a cash reserve. You know, having that cash, it, it does provide safety and, and I can totally get behind wanting to do that. But when inflation is up around 6%, 7% and, and your savings accounts are all less than 1%, like TC was saying in his portion, you know, you're losing your purchasing power and that's not good enough, right? Like eventually you're going to have to put something back at the grocery store um, with when, when you bring your, your $100 in, right? And so what you need to do is, again, sit down, figure out what a reasonable amount is for emergencies. Typically, we're going to say three to six months of income or expenses to go off of. So maybe that's 5000 maybe that's 10000 maybe that's 20000 But if you can get a point where you have this emergency savings set up and then you have your investments on top of that, well, what can happen is that then your, your investments are going to grow. They're going to be your financial freedom in the long run. And then when something does happen, you know, as we've stated, we know it will, something will happen eventually. We can just pull from our, our 10, 20,000, however much that comfortable number is for you. Cause again, everybody's going to be different. Um, and then at that point, then we look at replenishing that emergency savings. You know, do we take it from our investments at that point to replenish our savings? Do we just work on putting maybe a couple hundred dollars a month towards the, the emergency savings? So really just devising that plan, but absolutely you can be too, you're gonna have too big of a cash reserve. And essentially, like you said, um, too focused on the resiliency that in the long run, it ends up being detrimental to your to your overall well, financial well-being. Right, right. So it's like you, you want to keep like a few months reserve in case of disaster, but not like several years and that's money that's better reinvested, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we yeah. do see that quite a bit, you know, um, uh, oftentimes with maybe some of our more senior members where it makes a little bit more sense for them to have that that large reserve, um, especially if there's health issues and things like that. But ultimately, um, you do have to take sometimes a bit of a risk when it comes to your finances, because the risk okay. of no risk can can sometimes be be larger. Of course. Yeah. Hugo, I'd like to hop into because uh... I think this is especially important for businesses too, because obviously during the pandemic, people were kind of building up cash and all that, but you know, having all this cash sitting in an account, really there's an opportunity cost to that money. So this cash could likely be deployed in other ways um, to improve the operations of the business, such as research development. Uh, it, it's especially bad if you do have higher price debt sitting on your balance sheet. So if you have some higher price debt, use some of that, that excess cash to chunk that down. Um, invest in technology, which will help create efficiencies in your business, or even look at acquiring maybe like a, a complementary product or a company that uh, will help you diversify your revenue stream. Um, if you have lots of cash, it, it probably means you're running a successful operation. So with the war on talent today, uh, perhaps this could be used to pay out bonuses to help with employee retention, things like that. Um, also, like having lots of cash in your company could create issues down the road from a tax purposes when you're trying to get that money out of the corporation and, and into your personal savings. So, okay, so uh, ha have that nest egg, but you don't want it to be be too big, right? But don't hoard cash. I guess is the uh, <laughs> message there. Okay. Uh, next question is is for TC, and it's uh, why why is it important for companies to improve working capital? Uh, it's important for companies to improve working capital because it, it's the lifeline of your business. Um, this is what you use to, to fund the day-to-day -day operations. So without sufficient working capital, a business cannot make a short-term financial obligations, cover unexpected costs, purchase required products and services. So all of these items are vital to sustainability and success of, of any business, no matter what industry you're in. Um, so strong working capital allows a business owner to focus their efforts on growing sales or improving productivity which are all really value added work to, uh, for a corporation uh, or small business. Um, it's imperative to maintain and preserve working capital because the shortage of which is one of the primary reasons business fail. Um, too many people kind of open a business and they're just not well capitalized. So 
Working capital impact should be considered similarity, similar to profitability uh, considerations when you're looking at new growth strategies. So without the working capital, you will not be able to fill the new sales or kind of your existing orders that have been generated. Um, a company should always be aware of their working capital ratio, which provides a good indication of their ability to, to sort of meet their short-term uh, financial obligations. So if you're wondering, like, so if you divide your, your current assets by your current liabilities, uh, this will give you your working capital ratio. Um, now, the ideal ratio is very dependent on industry and circumstances. So if you're in a, an, a business that has a longer operating cycle, so, so time it takes to sell the inventory and collect your AR, uh, you may need to have a higher ratio than a company with a shorter operating cycle. So two red flags to watch out for are, are ratios that are A, trending downwards. So it's important to kind of find out why your working capital is trending in that direction. Um, because at some point, it, you may not be able to meet your, your debt obligations. Or if your ratio is less than one to one, this means that you don't have enough money to kind of meet your short-term debt obligations. So we're talking things kind of within a 12 month horizon. So um, this could run you into trouble for, for making payments. Um, which you know you don't want to be choosing on who you're paying and who you're not paying at this time. So, uh, especially in today's market, where you're trying to acquire inventory, acquire uh, you know different products, uh, if, if you're if you're the the guy that's not paying your supplier, you're always late. Uh, when they do get that valuable inventory in for you, you know you're probably not going to have first crack at it. Um, plus, you know you, you could be paying additional costs for for carrying that debt. Because uh, that, that company is basically covering your uh, covering your working capital for you. Okay, so I feel like between those last two questions, we're sort of home, trying to home in on a Goldilocks zone, right? For like, what is too much cash? What is too little cash? I got a hand of it. It's it really a Goldilocks on. zone, right? Like, it's uh, yeah. we don't want too much, we don't want too little. Um, so yeah, yeah. And like you said, I think it's very dependent on on circumstances of the business or of the individual, which is why it's important to to reach out to experts at Meridian and uh, you know other financial experts to get to uh, get this dialed, dialed in, right? Yeah, yeah. Talk to your accountants. Uh, you know, they're a great resource. They see tons of companies um, and, and generally a lot in your industry, so so they can kind of let you know where you sit relative to your peers, and and they can kind of. Um, also help help you with working capital strategies and advise you on uh, you know what's a good way to raise capital, what the pros and cons are, and stuff like that. So definitely kind of reach out to your trusted advisors on, on this one. Excellent. Uh, uh, on this on that note, actually, of uh, getting advice. Now, Scott, you mentioned the financial resilience score, but and I think this is a great tool to have because there's a lot of people, including business people and solopreneurs, who find finance to be very difficult or intimidating. And a lot of business people, in particular, would rather work on the business than work on the financial aspects. And a lot of uh, individuals as well just find this to be. Uh, intimidating and they don't want to get into the numbers of it. So are there any other like easy tools or resources you'd recommend to people who maybe don't have a lot of experience with finance, but just sort of need to get a better handle on things? Yeah. So, I mean, a bit of a Meridian plug here. There, it, there is uh, some great resources on our website um, under the Good Sense tab, the Meridian homepage. Um, with lots of articles from lots of different advisors um, and even some, some external um, individuals as well who, <clears throat> excuse me, who Meridian has uh, worked with in the past. Um, so lots of great articles to just start generating those ideas of, of what can I do to improve my financial situation. Um, and then scour the internet for like, for, uh, for, calculators and, and other financial tools like that. My favorite one is the compound interest calculator. And you can find that on any, probably any bank's website. I know Meridian has some, I know you can find some just on external websites as well. Um, it's, it's really puts it into perspective when you can kind of see what a little bit each month can do for you in the long run. Um, and uh, you mean, I mean, we all want to get rich quick, but I'm very much of the mindset of get rich slow. Take your time, do the right things, put the money into some strong, solid investment. Um, and then on top of that, make sure that your debts are still being managed and your day to day cash flow is, is still working. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say, you know, go, go through some calculators, um, go to the Meridian Good Sense uh, blog there and um, you can sort through all of all different articles from 
again, mortgages to investments, uh, business, um, and uh, they even have some uh, like family uh, sort of investments. So like if you want, or our articles, I should say that, so if you want to talk to your kids or maybe you're talking to your parents about, uh, you know, different investment ideas, uh, definitely, you know, go to the website, meridiancu.ca uh, under the Good Sense tab and, and check it out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I think get rich slowly is, is good advice generally. You know, if, if you do have any advice in getting rich quick, then then please let me know. <laughs> not not here. This is me later. I don't I want to share this with anyone else. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that that's great. So definitely, everyone should take advantage of those tools and, and build it up. Um, the next question is is for TC, and it, it's it's sort of a, a cultural question, especially for like a firm that has multiple employees and the financial health of an organization depends on more than one person, but how can a company create a, a culture of financial resilience? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it really just starts with leadership. Um, so this is probably the most critical factor in driving organizational culture. Um, people will generally follow the behavior of their leaders, which in turn is kind of creates cultural norms within your uh, organization or corporation. Um, so when a leader is engaged and leading by example, your employees will follow suit. Uh, second, I would say probably accountability. So empower your employees so that they feel a shared responsibility for, for managing the risks and taking ownership of their actions. Uh, I know here at Meridian, they really instilled a culture that we're all risk managers, uh, which forces people to keep this front of mind when they're making decisions, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, giving out advice on, on, a, on a loan or, or approving credit for somebody or writing an application. Um, another way is kind of focusing on your employees. So kind of help your workers prepare for the unexpected. Uh, you can look at offering your employees access to financial literacy programs. So it, it's one thing to offer good pay and benefits, but without basic knowledge of financial literacy, such as investments, budgeting, debt management, is not likely to translate into financial resiliency for your employees themselves. So if they know how to themselves be financially resilient, uh, you know, they're going to bring that kind of attitude and culture to the workforce. Um, and kind of on that same plan, like, uh, you know, a promote retirement best plan, retirement plan best practices. So uh, many employers offer some sort of defined contribution pension plan, but do not provide their employees uh, with the proper knowledge and tools to ensure they're investing appropriately for their age and lifestyle goals in retirement. Um, I know, uh, like myself, I, I you know the market's been kind of down so my my rsps have kind of been in the tank right recently but uh it's especially important kind of as you get closer to retirement um you know you can't be in those high risk uh high risk mutual funds or investments so uh, i know a lot of uh pension plans will offer kind of a, a targeted uh age of retirement that automatically kind of rebalances your your holdings along the way so you know, when, you, when you're younger, in your 20s, 30s, you know, it's a little more high risk. You kind of move into your 40s, 50s. It gets you kind of that medium or low risk. And then kind of as you retire, you're, you're in those lower risks where there's going to be not as much upside. But it's really going to take the volatility out of your uh, retirement savings because a lot of people, once they retire, like there's no more income coming in. So and the last thing you want to do once you retire is, uh, you know, go out and get a part time job. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's the last thing I want to do when I retire. <laughs> that, but for sure. Uh, but maybe uh, Scott, I can turn to you next. And this is it is a bit of a, an interesting question, but I guess uh, the answer might just be a flat no. I don't know. But is it really possible to be financially disaster proof? Like, can you ever sort of say you're in a situation where no, I can weather anything. I'm good, notwithstanding having a billion dollars or whatever. But yeah, I was going to uh, say, is yeah. that possible? How, how, do you, how do you get there? <laughs> um, no, I would say for the the average person, no, there's there's no way of being 100% disaster proof. You know, there's so many things that could come along, right? Like who who would have predicted that the pandemic would have came in and, and wreaked havoc the way it did? Um, you know, and then other like personal things, right? Uh, you know, a, a divorce could uh, could could really you know reset you. And, um, you know, or, or a death in the family, you know, as unfortunate as it is, um, making sure that, you know, you have those insurances in place um, is, is extremely important. Um, so, so no, there's no way to be 100% disaster proof, but with a good plan, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but, you know, you could be, you know, 95% disaster proof in a sense that, you know, there'd be only a, a, a few things that would really take, take you right down. Um, and I mean, ultimately, 
there is going to always be that that little bit of a, of a risk. I mean that that is life. <laughs> um, there is there is you know no no crystal ball for us to see exactly what is going to happen. Um, but ultimately, setting up that plan is what's going to be able to put you in the best um, uh, the best vehicle to to get you to your destination, which is ultimately full financial freedom. Right, right. So it's like managed risk and minimized risk is really what you're saying, the absence of risk. That, that makes total sense. Yeah. And uh, something uh, I want to touch on, maybe maybe we have time for one more question. So I want to ask, um, you both mentioned in your presentations uh, the, the financial shocks that are coming uh, now, like the inflation rates going up, interest rates going up, issues of supply chains, and there's going to be probably future interest rates coming as well. Um, so there's a lot coming uh, in terms of instability. Is there anything that uh, businesses or individuals can do to, to prepare themselves for these specific shocks or any other shocks that we think there's a reasonable chance of occurring uh, in the future? And I, I think that's for both of you, but uh, TC, maybe I can, I can start with you on that. Yeah, so it's not to repeat myself, but yeah, just do a general health checkup on your business. So look at your expense management. So where are you seeing the most bang for your dollar? And this is especially, uh, you know, things like advertising and another cost like that. Um, look, see if there's any ways to automate processes. Look for other suppliers and substitutes. Like I said, it, it's great to have a great relationship with suppliers, but you should always have a plan B because if somebody doesn't have the whatever you need, somebody else generally will. Um, but yeah, I understand how much every dollar you earn and, and where is this dollar going? Um, you know, manage your accounts receivable appropriately. Like you don't want to be financing someone else's working capital, uh, especially if working capital is becoming tight for yourself. Uh, you know, if, if you are doing pricing changes, just be communicate transparency. Um, other, be in touch with suppliers and customers. So what are they seeing? What are their needs? Um, you know, somebody might kind of give you a heads up that they have a big project coming up and they're going to need, you know, a, a ton of widgets, right? Like kind of uh, the old widget term. So can you buy these widgets in bulk? Can you kind of get them in advance? Can you kind of start stockpiling them knowing that the sale is coming? Now, you know, that is a bit of a risky strategy in case that sale doesn't come and, and now you're stuck with all these widgets. But, uh, you know, generally uh, you can have those on those conversations. Um, if you are have these projects coming up, talk to suppliers, see if you can kind of negotiate more favorable terms for yourself. Um, you know, it may be, Maybe if you have the working capital on hand, you, you can kind of pay early ahead of like the 30 or 60, 90 day term and get a bit of a discount. Um, you know, the war for talent right now is kind of like hotter than ever. So, you know, take an assessment of your talent pool. So who are your key employees? Make sure they're identified. Make sure you're taking care of them. Uh, if a key employee leaves, it can cause a whole bunch of issues from uh, productivity, uh, you know, just the cost to kind of train that new employee that's gonna come in and take over the role. Uh, and obviously a new employee generally isn't as efficient as a, as, as employee that's been around. Um, and, and I guess another relevant topic kind of with the aging baby boomers and uh, people leaving the workforce is, is uh, making sure you, you capture that, that knowledge that that employee has. Because once they're out the door, there's no way to get it out of their brain and into the next employee that's coming to step into that role. So uh, make sure you're doing some cross training and things like that. So if there is wage heights and you have to let somebody go or you have to downsize your workforce, you're, uh, you know, you're putting yourself in the best position at the end of the day. So. Okay. That's sound advice. Scott, any, any thoughts on uh, the coming shocks and what we can do to prepare? Yeah, I would say just from the individual perspective, I mean, the biggest one is going to be inflation and, and interest rate hikes. So um, for the inflation, you know, your dollar is obviously not going to go as far as, as it was, you know, a year ago. Um, if you can take a look at your budget and just see where you might be able to save, whether that, you know, means that you you don't eat takeout for, for a week. If you can save yourself a hundred dollars, that's, that's going to go uh, a, a long way. Um, maybe, maybe it's a uh, carpooling to work uh, a few days with the way that gas prices are right now. I think they're supposed to hit $2 this week, which is uh, crazy. So um, and then, uh, you know, as my grandpa always told me, if you watch your pennies, your dollars will watch themselves. So, um, just kind of finding those little areas where you can, you know, adjust for the inflation, then you, then you'll, uh, your dollars will watch themselves and you'll, you'll be okay. Uh, and then the interest rate hikes, um, if you can, you know, get on top of, uh, your, your mortgage rates before they, before they start to increase even more, then, then you'll be in good shape in the long run. 
That's excellent advice. Yeah, and I think it's perhaps a, a good note to end this on as we are coming to the end of our hour together. And it's been a very insightful one uh, for me, especially. I'd like to thank Scott and TC for their time today and for their insights. And uh, it, it's been a great learning experience. And I hope that everyone here has been able to, to learn something from this. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. If you need more information or you have any questions about uh, the topics discussed today, please reach out. Um, this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on our site and to all attendees if there's anything that you'd like to review. And that's it. Thank you all once again so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you for having us, Hugo. Thank you for having us. Take care.